All right, so just a quick quick review, right? So when so uh, when when you think of uh, when you think of biblical theology, I'll talk a little bit about this more tomorrow. But I think of biblical theology in terms of a of a of a historical storyline, right? In terms of it's a descriptive story. You know, when you do systematic theology, you say what is uh, say for instance what is what does the Bible teach on the Trinity? And you go everywhere uh, from the beginning. But when you do biblical theology, at least I understand it, you're, you're focusing on the, on the explicit storyline of Scripture, right? So, uh, and you look at the canonical con- contribution of each book, which is basically what my book does, right? It marches through the storyline. Jim Hamilton's book does the same thing. Some of you are reading uh, that book. You, so you, you march through the storyline, you march march through that storyline uh, historically. It's uh, bib- uh, systematic theology can be atemporal, right? By atemporal, I mean uh, it, it doesn't consider the temporal sequence and by which things happened. But when you're doing, when you're doing biblical theology, you're, always, you're, you're thinking of, of history. Of course, that's a little too simplistic, isn't it? Because because in systematic theology, systematic theology is fed by biblical theology, of course. But, but in biblical theology, we restrict ourselves more to the biblical storyline. So, you know, how did, how, did, how did the story start with creation? God creating man and woman to be his vice regents. Uh, under his authority, they uh, rebelled. They fell into sin. Uh, God, God promised through the Genesis 3.15, through the offspring of the woman to triumph over the serpent and the serpent's offspring. Then we, saw, we see the battle of the seeds. Uh, that's, that's a big part of the story, isn't it? From Cain and Abel, from the Sethites and the Cainites, from, uh, from the children of Abraham to the rest of the world, from, uh, from Saul and David, and... and, and uh, on and on it goes. So in that storyline, God selects Abraham. The, the, wor- the world's going to be blessed through Abraham and his offspring. We have land, seed, and blessing. Uh, Exodus, Genesis and Exodus are mainly about offspring, the offspring being multiplying. Although in Exodus, you, know, you see Israel liberated from slavery in Egypt. Then you know, moving very quickly when we get to when 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 we get to Joshua, they end up being uh, planted in the land. So the second element of the promise is fulfilled, and then uh, everything seems to be poised for worldwide blessing. But we saw declension in Judges, didn't we? Then, then as we come to First and Second Samuel, you have you have the covenant with David, so that. That promise of land, seed, and blessing is narrowed down in such a way that it's going to be fulfilled through a king. It's going to be fulfilled through a, a Davidic king. Uh, that's an, a, a dynasty will, that will last forever. With Solomon, it seems as if we're poised for the promise to be fulfilled in, in its fullness for universal blessing, but then there's declension. And really, from Solomon on down, so 900 BC or so, just roughly speaking, chronologically, from Solomon on down, the nation declines, and uh, so that we see the north and the, and the kingdom splits. Right, the northern kingdom goes into exile in 722 BC, the southern kingdom in 586 BC. So I mean that that's the story in broad strokes that we've been looking at, the the story of uh, of uh, Israel's. Uh, the promise given to Israel, the covenants given to Israel, and yet, yet the promises aren't aren't being uh, fulfilled. So, right now we're we're looking at some of the wisdom literature. So today, we're looking at some of the writings, and 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 the prophets, and then my goal is maybe we'll get to the New Testament today. Maybe not. But my goal is to get to the New Testament tomorrow. I mean, we're doing this in five days, right? So we're going very fast. And um, it seems good to spend two days in the New Testament as well. So, you know Proverbs. 
Pro Proverbs isn't advancing the storyline, right? Proverbs, Proverbs, Proverbs is reflecting on what it means. So what, what is the canonical contribution of Proverbs? Proverbs, I think, reflects on what it means to live under God's lordship. What does it mean to have God as your king? And, and I point out there that some say Proverbs is just secular wisdom, but there's no realm of life separated from God for Israel. And actually, the theme of Proverbs, I think, is in chapter 1, verse 7, the fear of the Lord and chapter 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the beginning of knowledge. So, so Proverbs is fundamentally God-centered, isn't it? Well, just as we saw in Job 28, the fear of the Lord is fundamental. And then I've given you these texts that show in Proverbs in a number of passages that God is central uh, to the book. Um, so we could do a lot of different things, but we, we're just touching down. I, I think it's interesting. The reflections of the heart, the plans of the heart, right, belong to mankind, but the answer, the tongue, is from the Lord. Or a person's heart plans his way, but the Lord determines his steps. So I, th I think that's very interesting because Proverbs is all about wisdom, discernment, understanding, exhorting the readers, the hearers, the son to be wise, discriminating, prudent, thoughtful. We're to plan our own way. You're to, th you're to think about what to do, right? Reflect upon what to do. You're to uh, consult many advisors if it's a big decision. But finally, but that doesn't mean even though there's a great accent on what we do as human beings, that, that doesn't mean that the Lord's not determining our steps. The Lord is determining our steps through the way we're thinking as long as we're trying to please him, of course, right? He's guiding us. He's, he's leading us. He's, he's, uh, he's uh, directing us uh, as, as we think about things. So that, that's very helpful, isn't it? That's very helpful in terms of discerning God's will. By the way, there's so many good books out today about Finding the Will of God, and I'm sure you're familiar with these pastorally. Uh, I'm J.I. Packer. I mean, I don't remember the titles of all these books, but you can Google them. J.I. Packer has an excellent book. Bruce Waltke has an excellent book. Kevin DeYoung has an excellent book on this. So um, there's lots of good resources to give people on that topic. An another interesting thing about Proverbs uh, is... The, the emphasis on wisdom, on wisdom being uh, tied on your hands and bound, bound in your heart, that reminds us of the Torah. So you have this wisdom theme, and, but you have this Torah theme bound together. The, 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 those who are wise, those who are wise who have the law on their heart, and, and, and we think of Psalm 1, which is really a wisdom psalm, right? You, you see... The, the, the wise person meditates on the law of the Lord day and night. So, th so those w wisdom isn't just knowing from the outside what's right, is it? Pro <laughs> Proverbs, you know, I'm thinking of Proverbs chapter 2 here. Proverbs has this notion of wisdom that wisdom enters into who you are. You know, it's, it, it, it constitutes your being so that, so that it isn't, wisdom isn't like, discerning from the outside what's the right decision, it, be, it becomes part and parcel of your character. So your character is shaped in such a way that you become wise, that, that you become uh, a discerning person. And then we see, uh, uh, clearly Proverbs says much about wisdom and speech. 
a good word for pastors, right? Those who are wise speak healing words. Those who are wise feed others with their words. Uh, fools, what does a fool do? A fool speaks without thinking in advance. <coughs> fools believe in totally in authenticity, by which I mean fools say, I'm going to say whatever I think whenever I think it. But, but Proverbs says a person who, who does that is a fool. <laughs> <laughs> the person who says, I'm, because I'm feeling it, I'm going to speak it. That's what, that's what fools do. Um, so lo- lots of good convicting words here about speech and words. Proverbs says, too many words equal sin. John Wesley said, I, I don't think this is a command of the Lord, but John Wesley said, don't ever have a conversation with a person more than an hour, because after that you'll probably start to sin. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't think that's a word of the Lord, but I thought, but we understand what he's getting at. That we can, we, even boredom can creep in, and then we can begin to say, well, it might be a bit more interesting if we gossip or something like that. Proverbs has a lot to say about riches and poverty. Proverbs is a very practical book, isn't it? That um, often people are poor because they're lazy. They're indolent. Uh, so I, I use the word often, but that, that's a good word, isn't it, to reflect upon. Some, some people are, are not prospering because they're undisciplined, and they don't know how to uh, work hard. Of course, that's, that's so much transmitted through families, isn't it? So that parents, to teach their children, to teach their children how to how to work. One of, one of my PhD students, I mean, not everybody's like this. I wasn't like this as a father, but I mean, he, uh, he, he gives his children over the summer, each of his children a task for the summer, like, like whatever it is, building a fence or something like that, you know, just to give, give them jobs that aren't just necessarily simple jobs, but tasks to work through. The rich often work hard. And he speaks of the benefits of riches. Nevertheless, we're warned not to trust in riches. And so some people, you know, some people say Proverbs is very simplistic on these matters. Proverbs, uh, some object, uh, oh, Proverbs, uh, Proverbs teaches that the, those who are poor are lazy. Those who are rich work hard. But Proverbs isn't that simplistic. Right, we all know, I haven't said this, but I'm kind of taking it for granted. We all know that Proverbs are principles, not promises. Right, Proverbs are observations about life. Proverbs aren't universal in most cases. I mean, different Proverbs work different ways. But many of the Proverbs are just observational. And so, um, Proverbs also says some people get riches wickedly. (laughs) It's not simplistic. Proverbs doesn't teach, well, if you're, if you're rich, it's because you worked hard. No, in some cases, you're rich because you've worked the system. <laughs> it recognizes that. And, and it also recognizes maybe you're poor because you've been oppressed. So you know, one, one thing we need to do when we look at Proverbs is re- to, to, to consider the whole of what Proverbs says, because the way the Proverbs are placed It doesn't put all the topics together. So it's good to, if you're going to look at a theme in Proverbs, right, it's good good for you to remember to look at everything that's said about poverty and riches. Don't restrict yourself to one or two passages, because if you do, you could end up saying something that, in preaching or teaching that's overly simplistic. No, it's true, isn't it? Often, often those who are rich, it's because they've worked hard. But it also can be true. They're rich because they've uh, engaged in some kind of injustice. Yes, the poor person may be poor because they haven't worked hard, but maybe they've been oppressed. Maybe they've been treated unjustly. He, the author warns us about mocking the poor and mocking God. He, he, Proverbs says the poor person may have more integrity than the rich person. So... How do we discern these things? Wisdom. I, there's not a rule here. Wisdom discriminates and determines 
what's happening. Sometimes we don't know, do we? But wisdom di discriminates and, and uh, assesses and considers and reflects on what's happening in a particular circumstance. So proverb isn't so simple. Sometimes he says the rich are very unhappy. A very, very interesting comment where he says, give, us, give me neither poverty nor riches. Don't give me poverty because I might steal and dishonor God. Don't give me riches because I might forget God. Then, then it's interesting to see um, what the proverb says about the king. Uh, the king, he, he says, kings don't sit in their speech. They hate evil. They remove evil before them. They love goodness. People should fear the king. Sometimes the king almost sounds like God. They search out what is hidden. The heart of the king is unsearchable. You know, there's, again, if you look at some of the proverbs, some of the Proverbs seem to almost say that whatever the king does is right. <laughs> you know, but we have to look at all the Proverbs. Kings may also do evil. They may listen to falsehood. They may do injustice. They may mistreat the poor. So again, when we, when we, when we look at any theme, we see again, we have to look at the whole of what Proverbs says on a subject. And then we have just many wise observations about life, don't we? We think of this in theological debate. One person seems right until one hears the other side. I feel that way about some theological issues. Even though I've written on this. Um, so, um, Romans 7. You know, I hear one side, it's pre-Christian. Yes, that's right. I hear the other side, it's Christian. And then I think, yes, that's right. <laughs> it's a very difficult issue. Uh, uh, to decipher. I've written on both, I've written both positions. So somewhere I'm right, right? Who, know, who knows where it is? Um, so I, I don't want to advertise that too much about my instability, but I like this one. Don't visit your neighbor too often or they'll get sick of you. So, you know, um, I just think of that in terms of people I like to visit Okay, don't limit the visits, right? You don't want them to get uh, tired of you. Or, you know, those laughing or joyful on the outside may be grieving on the inside. So forth and so on. I really like this one. If you have no oxen, you have a clean manger. I'm, I'm kind of a clean, organized person. I, d I don't think I'd want an oxen. They're messy, you know? All kinds of work. But he says, your manger may be clean, but you have, but you have no crops. <laughs> it's kind of messy, but you get more crops when you have the oxen, right? Um, or sometimes this is good for those of us who are theologians and pastors, even on the internet. Don't meddle in quarrels in our ears, <laughs> right? Don't, don't, don't get involved. I've kind of, sometimes I'm on Twitter, and sometimes on Twitter people want to invite me to a debate. I don't get on debates on Twitter. I can't do a theological debate on Twitter. I just ignore comments like that on Twitter because how, how you, it, there, it's, too, it's too superficial to try to answer people on, on Twitter in a, in a theological debate. So worrying about gossip and so forth and so on. Maybe I should say a word about this. You know, Proverbs is very strong about being vigilant about sexual sin. About the great dangers of it. So, uh, which is, which is a, constant, a constant issue, isn't it? So many pastors fall in that area. Uh, the future, Proverbs talks a lot about the future. Again, you know, we're just going very fast on this. I think, I, I agree. By the way, uh, what's the best commentary on Proverbs? I, I would say Bruce Waltke's two volumes in the, in the Nicot series. Uh, I preached through Proverbs, and I found Bruce's uh, two volumes very good. I still love the little volume by Derek Kidner. That's just an excellent. Derek Kidner is uh, very concise, but he puts things very beautifully. 
Anyway, I, I agree with Waltke. There's some indications that the author of Proverbs believed in eternal life. The righteous finds refuge in his death. I think that's a very interesting verse. The prudent will not experience Sheol. So I agree with Waltke. There's indications in the book of life after death for the righteous in Proverbs. You can write, read what I wrote there. What about the New Testament and Proverbs? And so, you know, this is a huge verse in the history of interpretation and in historical theology. The Lord, the Lord acquired me. This is talking about wisdom. Oh, that doesn't. The Lord acquired me at the beginning of his creation before his works long ago. This is wisdom. I was formed before ancient times. Maybe I'll take the LXX out of here. I was formed before ancient times from the beginning before the earth began. I was born. Now, I actually, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of the HTSB, but I, I think the verb acquired there is not a good translation for kana. I think it means created. And the argument I'd use is, uh, just the other words he uses, you know, I was formed, I was given birth to, I mean, I was given birth, right? Uh, I, I was established. It, this is poetry, right? This is poetry, and the, one of the reasons the early church had problems on this is the, the orthodox, those who are orthodox Christologically, wanted to argue that it can't mean created because then Christ would be created, <laughs> right? And the Arians, the Arians who argue that Christ was a creature, who are the modern-day Arians? Jehovah Witnesses, right? Jehovah Witnesses are modern-day Arians, that Jesus is a creature at the end of the day. The Arians went to this verse to say the Lord created wisdom at the beginning and said Christ was created. But, but here's the point. This passage isn't about Christ in its historical context. This passage is about wisdom. This is, a, this, is, this, is, uh, this, this is not a direct passage about Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus is the wisdom of God. He fulfills what the Old Testament says about wisdom. But he's greater than wisdom. So I think both sides were wrong to appeal to this verse to see it as a direct statement about Jesus. It's not a direct statement. Yes, Jesus fulfills what we find in the Old Testament. Jesus is the wisdom of God, but he's greater than wisdom. Uh, wisdom here is just personification. It isn't, it isn't a, a creature of some kind. So that's just an important reflection on history of interpretation. Um, I would say earthly riches and blessings in Proverbs point to eternal blessings and riches. You know, in the Old Covenant, you're promised earthly riches and blessings for obedience. I, well, we see this in the New Testament. How does the New Testament appropriate those, that language in terms of eternal riches and blessings? We can talk more about that in the New Testament. So, I mean, that was really, really quick, wasn't it? But anything you want to say about Proverbs, just anything at all? Any comments, questions, refutations? Yeah. On the subject of Proverbs 8 and, and trying to connect with Christ, what, what advice do you have on discerning legitimate connections in Scripture and uh, not wanting to fall on either side of the error of either disbelieving legitimate collection connections or making illegitimate connections? Yeah. I think a lot of it has to do with... Um, all, uh, I'd say methodologically, to, to at least two things at the beginning. We always read the Old Testament in its historical context first. So when people go astray typologically or even allegorically, they, they tend to jump over the original historical context. So we want to make sure that we're accurately interpreting the, what the original author was saying to the original readers. And I think that's where many go astray. They, they jump to Christ so quickly. I mean, some people don't jump to Christ at all. <laughs> that's a danger as well. But some people jump to Christ so quickly. In our circles, it's more jump to Christ. I don't know your circles as well. 
But in our circles, it's, they jump to Christ so quickly that sometimes they lose the per se voice, I'd say, the historical voice of the Old Testament itself. And then we want to see, the second thing I'd say, we want to see how the New Testament appropriates, appropriates that Old Testament witness. And we recognize the Old Testament appropriates that witness not always in a one-to-one -one correspondence. We, so, you know, in a way, it's like reading these things in context, and we see... Now, I'm going to argue some things today. You may not agree with some of the things we're going to say when we come to the prophets. I'm going to show you some examples where I don't see a one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, so, hopefully, we can return to that, and I'm happy to hear from you. Anything else on Proverbs? Yeah. Sir, uh, what's your take on the view that says that the Proverbs 31 woman is not an actual woman, but just personification of wisdom? Um, I think it is an actual woman. I mean, I think he's thinking of a, of a godly wife. Um, I just think there's too much specificity about the wife to think that he's talking about wisdom. So, yeah. Yeah. On Proverbs 8 one more time, uh, how would you respond to those who say the Kana verb and they connect that with begotten? Say, well, it's not saying that he was created, but this is Christ and he was begotten. That's what's referred to. Yeah, well, I would say, so then he was formed, verse 23, and, um, and then he was born. Are, that, are those all e eternal? Is that what they're saying? He was established? Uh, so I, I think it's clear I think it's clear what I'm what I'm arguing. I think it's clear from the parallel verbs. So that's what's important to me. The parallel verbs that are used that he's not talking about an eternal begetting. So, I mean, I'm open to that, but to to me, the parallel verbs don't all refer to. Some, I was formed before ancient times. I don't know how that refers to an eternal begetting. So. Do you see a narrative structure in Proverbs similar to Psalms? No, I don't. I don't. I haven't seen anybody who argues that. Have, or have you? Yeah. It was discussed briefly in my Old Testament survey class here, but I forget I've what it's called. Okay. Was. That, I think that'd be really hard to do with all those individual Proverbs. Well, that'd be interesting. I'm, I'm open to it, but I'm suspicious, you know? So, yeah. Okay. Let's go to, where are we? Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is the last, so I, I, you know, I stopped being our preaching pastor in 2015. The last series I did was on Ecclesiastes. I had a great time with it. What a, what a powerful book. Um, Often, often this book is read as a book of despair and hopelessness, existentialists, existential philosophers like the book. But you, you, we have to read the book in light of the entire canon. I argue that the conclusion of the book is the hermeneutical lens for the entire book. Many critical scholars argue that the conclusion of the book is a later edition. I'm not persuaded by that. But, but let's just pretend for a minute they're right that it's a later edition, the book is still a book. And therefore, even if we're a later redactor, I don't hold that view, but even if we were a later redactor, it still functions as the hermeneutical lens to read the rest of the book. So I, I don't think that's a good argument. I am not, in, um, incidentally, in terms of method, I'm not impressed by people who are telling us how these books were put together. Uh, in terms of additions and subtractions, uh, that is such a speculative enterprise. And, and everybody's always changing uh, what, what's added and what's subtracted because we really don't know. So I take it as part of the book from the beginning. But when all has been heard, the conclusion of the matter is this, fear God and keep his commands because this is for all humanity, for God will bring every act to judgment including everything, whether good or evil. So that's our wisdom theme. Whether Job or Proverbs or Ecclesiastes, fear God. 
What is Ecclesiastes about? It's about fearing God and keep his commandments. So when I preached this book, I said throughout, we have to always remember why we're told everything we're told in this book. And we're told everything we're told in this book to, so that we'll recognize a future judgment is coming. There's a future reckoning going on. So the message of the book isn't that life is absurd and meaningless. There's a focus on commandments. The message of the book is God is sovereign. God predetermines what happens, but we can't calculate his way. I agree that Kohelet here, by the way, this is a minority view in scholarship, but I agree that Kohelet refers to Solomon. I just think that's the most natural way of understanding it. So the book, the book, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm probably speaking to the choir here. But the book is one of wisdom. He wrote words of truth. What he says reflects the words of the wise. So I'm, what am I speaking against? I'm speaking against those who say, well, this, is, this book doesn't fit with the rest of the Old Testament, right? Now, the, the, the words in this book are the word of God. He talks about the futility of life under the sun, translated vanity. But vanity today... I think futility or meaninglessness is a better word because vanity, I, I, contemporaries don't understand the word vanity. They may understand that you're so vain, <laughs> you're proud. That's not what he's talking about. Life, life is hevel, striving after, striving after the wind. He talks about life under the sun 29 times, life on earth. So, so he so he considers life from an earthly standpoint. Very profound, right? Life is futile because we do the same things over and over again. And does it have any effect? Work is futile because you work all your life, you make money, he says, and you may leave it to a fool. Or he says, even people who work hard often do so out of envy, right? They just want to best someone else. Pleasure is futile. Money doesn't satisfy. It can be gone in a day, so forth and so on. So, so um, what, what a good message to preach to people today. This is a great book, not just for believers, but for unbelievers. Where are you looking for your satisfaction, your intellect, pleasures? Ultimately, ultimately, it, it does not satisfy. You know, if you've read, uh, you know, it's such a scourge. It's a, it's, a, it's a problem everywhere, right? Pornography is such a problem. If you've read about it, people who, who give themselves to it, if you've read the studies, they... Um, they does it satisfy? It ultimately doesn't satisfy people who indulge in it. Finally, many of them, they can, they can no longer enjoy sexual relations with their spouse. So uh, in, instead of finally bringing satisfaction, it, it shrivels someone up, right? And enjoys, it, 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 it dampens the enjoyment that God uh, gives to those who are married. So uh, the, the pleasures of life that which brings pleasure, whatever it is, finally, whatever they are, they don't ultimately satisfy. Life is full of injustice and oppression. Life is often unfair, so forth and so on. Um, so I'm not lingering on this very long because we talked about Job yesterday, very much like Job, right? So we could talk about this longer. We have a lot to do in this class, but... Ecclesiastes, like Job, reminds us you can't calculate what's going to happen in life. The, uh, the, the, the best team may not win, right? The, the best team doesn't always win the World Series. Uh, 